Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. Hello and welcome back to Capes on the Couch, where comics need counseling. I'm Anthony Sitko and joined once again by my good friend, Dr. Issues. Greetings and salutations, chum. I would like... Well, I'm I'm sorry. I think I, I, think I got a different writer. I know I asked for a different writer, but I think this one needs to be fired. So, yeah. okay. All right. We're going we're gonna to need an, another new writer. I'll put an ad out on Craigslist or something, or maybe Fiverr. So, as always, you can find us... Uh, distributed through the Libsyn network. Uh, our website is capesonthecouch.live. You can find us on Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and YouTube. We have our Twitter page. Uh, we've got a Facebook page and capesonthecouch at gmail.com if you would like to email us any questions, comments that you have. Before we get started with this week's episode, once again, a reminder that next week, April 25th, is our big special Infinity War episode where we're going to be focusing on the Mad Titan Thanos. So get your questions and comments in now because Doc and I are going to have a lot of fun covering Thanos. There, there's just so much to unpack, and, and especially with Avengers Infinity. War coming out next week. We really want to uh, blow that out and and make it a, a really, really big special episode. This is going to be a big one as well. We've got Rorschach from Watchmen as this week's featured guest. And uh, Doc, I know you uh, are in particular are a big fan of the Watchmen comic and have read it on a number of occasions. Um, so before we even get into the issues, what are, what are some of your thoughts about tackling such a very interesting and unique character? I have to say that I appreciate Alan Moore for everything that he's done for the comic book industry. He always took stances that he thought were the most appropriate for any given situation. Uh, it didn't matter if he thought it was going to be popular or not, but he uh, gambled on himself and won. The characters that he uses are... At times extreme, and I appreciate the fact that he, you know, was willing to take a chance on basically taking a severely disturbed person and making them the main protagonist. At least that's the way I've always interpreted Watchmen. Yeah, uh, Rorschach definitely is one of the key figures in the book, and uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Just on a side note, before we even get into that, this is our seventh episode, and I read somewhere that podcasts average out at about seven episodes or or rather that once you make it to seven episodes you're gonna be in it for a while like if you can make it to seven then you make it to like 15 or 25 and once you can make it to 25 you can make it to the next milestone and so on so i'm kind of proud at the fact that our little podcast here um which really just started as an idea last year has grown into something that we're both very proud of and continues to grow and continues to get support and listeners. Um, and it's all thanks to, you know, folks like you who are listening. So just, you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for letting us continue to talk about uh, our passions in this way and sort of welcoming us into your ears, your phones, your listening devices, whatever they may be uh, for the past uh, this is now seven weeks. So thank you uh, very much uh, to the listeners. I've been thinking about this. Maybe we should start referring to this as mental health edutainment. Edutain mental health edutainment. I like that. I don't know that there is anything quite like it. It's never uh, scared me to be a trailblazer in anything. So mental health edutainment. Uh, maybe we can add that as like a keyword huh. on the website somewhere. So let's dive into Rorschach. And by the way, for purposes of this discussion, we are only going to be discussing Rorschach number one, uh, Walter Kovacs. I know that there is the second Rorschach in the Doomsday Clock series slash event that is currently going on in D.C. And like most people, we're going to ignore it. Um, so we're going to focus on Walter Kovacs in the Alan Moore, Dave Gibbons Watchmen series. Uh, son of a prostitute and an unknown father who I think his name was Charlie. 
He's raised in a foster home. He then ends up working as a garment worker uh, where he acquires the materials to make his iconic Rorschach mask. He gets, I don't want to say inspired by the, the Kitty Genovese rape murder, which uh, was a real event where uh, apocryphally she was assaulted in the, I guess, the common area of her apartment complex and supposedly like two dozen witnesses watched this all happen and nobody said anything. Nobody reported it to the police. This is what eventually led to what we call the bystander effect, where a group of people collectively watch something terrible happening, but nobody takes it upon themselves individually to be the one to stop it, to report it to police, etc. So in any event, so like I said, that's why I, I use the term inspired very loosely because it, it was a legitimately terrible event. But he hears about this and decides to become Rorschach. He makes the mask with the um, the material that changes shape depending on the heat. And it's never fully explained exactly how it works within the comics. We just sort of accept that it's a white material with the black ink and it looks like a Rorschach ink blot. Uh, so he teams up with Dan Dryberg who is the second night owl and they join a collective group of a couple of other heroes. They're, they're doing some good, but it's really the incident where a man named Gerald Grice kidnaps a young girl, uh, murders her. Rorschach is, is on his trail and he's trying to, to locate this girl. And he, goes to, I think, 14 or 15 individuals trying to get information on Grice and where he is and where he took this girl. And he gets to Grice's house. He kills Grice's German shepherds with a meat cleaver. He hides in waiting for Grice to return, assaults him with the corpses of the German shepherds that he killed. He handcuffs him to a stove, tosses him a hacksaw, a la saw basically and says, yeah, you don't have time to cut the handcuffs, throws kerosene everywhere and lights the house on fire, watches it burn for an hour. No one comes out. So Grice dies. Rorschach kills Grice. And this is where we see the shift from, I guess, semi well-intentioned Kovacs to Rorschach, this non-compromising absolutist. What do you mean? I I think that's totally appropriate for any human being to do in a regular circumstance, right? I mean, that's how you handle any adversity or conflict with someone else, right? No? No, and I'm wondering if maybe your medical license should be revoked. Anyway, there is the Keen Act, which registers vigilante-type superheroes, and he refuses to register. So he is now basically, I guess, the only one unsanctioned who's operating outside the law or one of the only ones. I forget exactly. He questions former supervillain type Moloch about the death of the comedian, who was another member of the Watchmen, the, the group that he and Night Owl and Silk Spectre and Dr. Manhattan. I'm not going to delve into the history of the other characters because it's not really necessarily uh, pertinent to the discussion about Rorschach. I just have to say that I didn't think the comedian was very funny. And that's actually the point. That, that, that kind of is the point. And I don't think that Rorschach found him funny either. So he's he's investigating the comedian's death. He goes to Moloch's house, find out that Moloch has been killed. And now he's surrounded by the police. So he gets arrested and he's brought to prison where he's interviewed by Dr. Malcolm Long. And we'll touch a little bit about Dr. Long later. Uh, he instigates a riot, kills several prisoners. He gets broken out by Night Owl and Silk Spectre, who are of the mindset that maybe Rorschach's theory that someone was killing all the caped superheroes might not be such a crazy idea. He realizes Ozymandias, Adrian Veidt, is responsible for the killings. So he goes with Night Owl and Dr. Manhattan to confront him in Antarctica. And then once Vite basically admits, yeah, it was me, and I did it 35 minutes ago or however long it was, um, and that that really just twist of a scene, absolutely iconic, God bless Alan Moore. He asks Dr. Manhattan to kill him to prevent him from telling the truth because Vite did it in a way to, I guess, bring all of humanity together so that they would unite against this perceived alien threat, except 
Rorschach knows the truth and he's like, I'm going to tell everybody you're going to have to kill me to stop me. And Manhattan vaporizes him. There is no one innocent in Alan Moore's universe. That's the main takeaway that I got from Watchmen. Almost every character, both what we would consider protagonist and antagonist, have what they consider to be a positive agenda. And it's clear what that agenda is at the end. And yet the way that they process things and go about their results is so incredibly wrong. It's amazing. How do you create characters like this? That's fantastic. That's why he's Alan Moore. And that's why we're just two schmucks sitting here talking about him on a podcast. Anyway, so he so he dies, but not before he sends his journal to the press with his findings and understanding about what he thinks actually happened, whether or not that truth ever gets out is left ambiguous at the end of Watchmen. We're not going to get into the before Watchmen. We're not going to get into the doomsday clock stuff. We are focused primarily on the, you know, those 12 issues, the graphic novel of Watchmen uh, turned into the Zack Snyder film, which is absolutely just one of the Zack Snyderiest Zack Snyder films ever. Although I think that what was the one about the girls in the institution? Candy Crush, Candy Punch. What what the hell was the name of that movie? Oh, I that that was the Zack Snyderiest film that Zack Snyder's ever made. But Watchmen is a close second, as far as I'm concerned. I can't even possibly remember what it is sucker punch sucker punch that's the name of the film sucker punch so it was it was about a bunch of girls in a mental institution and they had fantasies that they were super powerful and but were they really fantasies it 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 was a messed up film man it was like i said the zack snyderist film that zack snyder's ever made but watchmen is a close second As far as I'm concerned, because it just operates in that dark mentality, because Zack Snyder doesn't believe in a world where good people are good and that there is brightness and happiness and sunshine and joy. He made Superman like dour. If you can turn Superman into a dour, brooding guy, you have some issues. But I I digress. Let's let's focus back on Rorschach. I apologize for that rant. It's just it, it builds in me sometimes and I have to let it out. So that's Rorschach. He is definitely one of the most unique characters uh, that we've examined on the show to this point. The first thing and I guess really the the primary central focus of Rorschach is his moral absolutism. Rorschach is not a man who believes in gray. He is a black and white, much like his mask, which, of course, symbolism. Uh, Rorschach is absolutely a moral absolutist. Everyone is good or evil. There is no in between. There is no possibility that you can do the right thing for wrong intentions or the wrong thing for good reasons. It is, if you do bad things, you are bad, no matter your intention. So I guess let's just pause there for a second. Doc, you want to unpack that moral absolutism? Okay, so I'm going to take some people back to if they've ever had experience in a college psychology course or developmental psychology course. Uh, There's a gentleman by the name of Lawrence Kohlberg, uh, and he developed the stages of moral development. Now, this is something that's theoretical. People don't automatically go from one stage to the next. There are stages that people don't ever reach. There are people that regress to previous stages. But in a nutshell, it basically indicates that when we first are born, we're concerned with our survival. So what what is the right choice is what helps us live. Uh, then from there, we learn from our parents and we develop a system more like, okay, uh, what's right is whatever other people tell me. And, you know, there are variations on this. And at some point it gets to the idea that society at large has something to do with how we process things in terms of what's right and wrong. And it becomes, okay, what's, you know, what's right is what's good for society. Uh, And then ultimately, you know, in higher level stages, we really get into philosophizing about, okay, well, what's the common good? What's our overall goals? How does that compare to me as an individual and, and relate to other people? How does, you know, how do we move things? Things forward, blah, 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 blah. What I'm getting at here is that Rorschach 
is very stuck at the most elemental level of what's right and wrong. And that's why we end up in a situation where he doesn't have an ability to process gray. You know, it's it's not much different than you ask a kid one of those famous moral questions. OK, a person goes into a drugstore and they need this treatment to save someone's life. And the person says, OK, that's five thousand dollars. And you find out later that that person stole the medication to save another person's life. You know, now there's a lot of things that could be debated about that. And Rorschach's mind is that man stole. That man is bad. That's pretty much what it comes down to. And I think most people right off the bat could see how that could be problematic when dealing with human beings that are incredibly complex and have multiple motivations. Uh, and of course, it also leads to the fact that since Rorschach is a human being with his own internal motivations, even if he doesn't realize it, he's going to have conflicts within himself that are going to be problematic for a long time. Yeah. And, and of course, because he's a human being, And because it is incredibly difficult, dare I say, impossible to maintain those kinds of standards in all areas of your life at all times, Rorschach is a hypocrite. Rorschach is absolutely a hypocrite. And we see that play out in a number of instances. The comedian attempts to rape uh, Silk Spectre, and that's... That, that's bad. I think we can all pretty much agree that uh, attempting to rape someone is not what one would consider to be a, a positive act. Rorschach believes it was a moral lapse and he excuses it. Rorschach focuses on the law and touts that he needs to help create the laws or enforce the laws because that's all that separates humanity from just utter and absolute chaos. Yet in pursuing the you know investigation into the death of the comedian, into going after Moloch and all of these things, he breaks and enters all the time. Uh, he tells Night Owl, you need to get a stronger lock. I was able to just shove the door open and bust it open. And he's like, well, why, why did you even break in? Because that's who Rorschach is. The, the laws are in his mind, but not necessarily applicable to him. You know, there's there's that sense that as long as he's doing it, it's okay. But if other people do stuff, they're evil. So the moral absolutism doesn't apply internally. And I think just from a, you know, psychological standpoint, that's incredibly fascinating as a character. You hit the nail on the head. This is a situation where he needs to recognize. I'll, I'll just go further than that. You can look at any law that's been written in society for the longest time. You can look at religious doctrines. I'll go with the one that I know just from my cultural and religious upbringing, thou shalt not kill. I mean, that's pretty big, right? I think we can agree on that. Generally speaking, I I think that is one that extends upon number of cultural and religious differences and backgrounds. So Rorschach's approach to things is if people are guilty. Let's just, you know, I I understand, you know, trials and everything, but the point is if we know someone has killed someone, what's Rorschach's response? To kill them. Okay, well, we know that that's going to potentially create uh, just an endless cycle of violence. And Rorschach doesn't really seem to have a problem with this whatsoever, because in his mind, he's absolved himself. He's done what he considers to be the correct punishment for someone that is killed. He doesn't have any checks or balances, basically. Well, and that obviously goes to the point of the title of the entire series is, you know, who watches the Watchmen. But also in his mind, going back to his rationalization, it's because he believes that he's the one who's cleaning up the filth, that they are the ones who broke the law. And he is the self-anointed or self-appointed guardian and Watchmen, again, to have to be responsible for fixing the world and fighting these, these injustices. So he's the one who can break the laws because he's doing it for the greater good, whatever that greater good that exists within his own mind. And that's the part that I think is incredible because I think everyone can see, and and I'll admit I didn't make it clear when I first mentioned it, 
if he's the one that's cleaning up the filth, I mean, he's basically taking, you know, a flamethrower to a dirty room. He's applying bleach to every colored cloth and wonders why everything is coming out absolutely blank. You know, he's leading to ultimate destruction himself. There is no way that you can have this system and not just end up with total destruction and chaos. The thing that he says he's trying to clean up that that is the ultimate paradox. Building on his his hypocrisy, he is a misogynist. And we see that partially because of his background. He really has a a warped view of sexuality and women because his mother was a prostitute. He saw her being beaten and then she in turn abused him. Uh, He worked in a garment factory, but felt uncomfortable handling women's undergarments. He talks regularly about the prostitutes that he sees around the city, comes with a, a high level of judgment towards them. And the interesting thing, of course, is that the very thing that sort of inspired him to become a crime fighter was the rape and murder of Kitty Genovese. And then the incident that shifted him into uncompromising Rorschach was the murder of a young girl. So while he's a misogynist, he also cares deeply about women. I think it's it's the Madonna whore complex. He's just got this in uh, mindset that as long as you're pure, he'll help protect you. But if you are in any way a sexual being or, you know, not pure in his mind, then you're not worthy of being saved and you're no better than the dregs and scum of society. So... Yeah, I'm going to point to a specific panel on the page that basically indicates the shift from Kovacs to true Rorschach. He's holding what in his hands as this panel appears red. He's holding a pair of little girls underwear and he notices that this woman has been destroyed. I I purposely shifted from saying girl to woman because it's purely the gender. It's purely... On one hand, the part that's the potential whores that enrages him, but it's the loss of the innocence of that child, you know, that allows him to think that he's doing justice. It's the combination that ends up becoming the problem, um, which once again, I apologize if it, if it sounds like we're saying too many positive things about Alan Moore. Well, then I guess he shouldn't have written such a great series. I don't know what to say. In those moments, he doesn't even look to create a relationship with, uh, I could say that about society at large, but especially with women, he he just doesn't want it. He he wants to be much more of a, if anything, if we're going to put any positive spin on this, he wants to be more paternal. He wants to be the authority figure that women can look to as opposed to an equal. He wants to... Um, be their provider. In theory, he'd be the one bringing home the bacon. In this case, he's slaughtering it. But, you know, you, you kind of get the point. And, and the other thing is, I was tempted to even look at this from a time context, because as we know, as generations have gone on, the place of women in society has greatly changed. I personally think for the better. But even when this was written, although there were much more conformist stereotypes of women... Rorschach's view even then is still considered extreme. You know, this is just how disparate his goals are from his own internal psyche. I can't think of another character. Well, if I had enough time, I probably could. But right now, I can't think of another character that embodies everything that can go wrong when you see yourself as the only good person on Earth. Yeah, I think that definitely uh, sums it up. Uh, Building again off the uh, hypocrisy and to continue that point about how society's views have shifted. He's a homophobe and we we see that come out in the one reference, I believe, to uh, I think it's Night Owl. He, He considers him possibly homosexual and views that as a negative. And and I don't know that it's I mean, I can't speak to. Alan Moore's mindset when he wrote it. Uh, Certainly society's views on homosexuality have shifted uh, since 1986, whenever this was written. I also don't know that it was necessarily homophobia itself, but it was the notion that 
I mean, I'm sure that played a part in it, but it may also just be the notion of Night Owl as having a sexuality period because Rorschach is most assuredly asexual. So the fact that Night Owl could have any sexual preference, certainly, again, I think he's judging him for being homosexual, but I think he judges him for having asexual preference, period. So uh, I don't know that that necessarily, again, applies to the Madonna Horror Complex or, or can it? I'm asking you as your, you know, your professional opinion, is it possible to have the Madonna Horror Complex apply to men that he may consider homosexual? Because it, and it's never really clear and it isn't really expounded upon. So I'm just sort of spitballing theories, but I'm just tying in again to the notion that this plays into his moral absolutism, that he is the sole arbiter of what is right and what is good. To put it into a modern context, um, there are certain terms that have become more popular recently. And by recently, I mean over the past few years, bromance, man crush, things like that, where there's no implication of homosexuality, but the idea that people of the same gender can actually have positive emotional feelings towards one another without sexuality. It's something that in theory, might be a positive thing for someone like Rorschach. He doesn't, you know, being asexual is not necessarily something that's a problem if the person still considers themselves productive and no one else sees it as a problem. That's fine. But in his case, it's clear that it's a lack of connection with other people in any aspect, not just sexuality, that creates even more of a problem. So to, to get back to your point and your question, you know, is there perhaps a variation on the whore Madonna situation um with this one i'm not so sure we have direct evidence that rorschach experienced women in a certain way we don't have evidence from childhood with the exception of basically schoolyard fights i mean just violence of how he deals with the same sex he didn't have a father figure so we don't know how that played out you know, so I can't automatically go to that dichotomy of sex versus no sex when it comes to the male gender because I don't have evidence of it. I have evidence that he's willing to attack men on all levels and all fronts instantaneously when he thinks they're wrong. Now, is that different from how he treats women? He'll degrade them. He'll say negative things. He'll point out very clearly how he detests people that he considers to be of lower moral fiber. But I'm not so sure that well, actually that's a good question. I'm just going to throw this out there. And, and if anybody has the answer, because I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, how does he respond to women? How does he attack them? I don't remember that in there. I don't know that he interacts with that many women, honestly, aside from from Silk Spectre. There really isn't a whole lot of women in his circle. And that, again, points to the the Madonna whore complex notion, him viewing himself as the the protector of women and the protector of that innocence. But at the same time, as you said, his experience with women, his mother was a prostitute who then abused him. So that's deep seated misogyny on a base level that never really gets resolved and just continues to come out in all of his dealings with the opposite sex to the extent that we see them. Right. And I'm saying I don't see any evidence given if there's something of that similar deep seated nature with men. So yeah. so I don't know. That's that's my honest answer. And it's funny that you bring up bromance because he does, at least early on in his career, have kind of a bromance with Night Owl, with Dryberg. Dryberg is the closest thing to a friend, quote unquote, that I could say that that Rorschach has or had at some point. You know, he goes to Dryberg repeatedly throughout the series, you know, and consults him. And Dryberg is like, why are you keep coming to me, you know, with all this crazy stuff? Like, I'm retired. And ultimately, it's Rorschach who kind of brings Dryberg out of retirement. Well, it's a combination of Rorschach and, and Lori, but they bring Dryberg out of retirement. But Dryberg is really the closest thing that Rorschach has to a friend. That's an excellent point. I would argue, though, that the balance of that friendship is lopsided. You mentioned how basically Night Owl comes back. I would argue the greater influence of having a person that he considered to be an equal fighting in an alley against 
common criminals and getting that adrenaline rush and the sexual rush, let's be honest, Silk Spectre. That's a real obvious point. He tolerates Rorschach. He basically says, okay, I'm going to do this because I think somewhere you're doing a positive thing for humanity. But in this case, Rorschach, I think, is more or less just using him as a tool. And he says, well, this is the least offensive person that is going to help me do what I want to do. I don't I'm not sure that he views him as a friend. I think he views him as someone that can get the job done. To be blunt, a contractor, (laughs) more or less. Okay, I may be wrong. (laughs) Now, moving out of the the moral absolutism, one of the interesting facets of Rorschach is, again, he's really the closest thing to like a POV character that we have throughout this series. And that is largely due to his narration in the journal that he keeps throughout his investigation of the comedian's death and the one that he ends up sending to the press. And he's got a very distinctive writing style and speaking style. And it's of note that it shifts after the the Grice attack, because in the flashback to the early Watchmen, he talks dare I say, like a regular person. When he's writing and speaking, it is very, I guess, abrupt. If it could be said that he writes staccato, I would make that argument because it's very uh, bereft of prepositions. It's bereft of pronouns. It is like verb noun, adjective verb noun style, very dense well, maybe not dense is sparse. That's the word I was looking for. Very sparse writing style speaks very similarly. I don't, I don't know who uh, lettered it. I don't know if that was Gibbons or someone else, but just the the wavy, the kind of like the wiggly wave around the, the speech bubbles and even the diary and the handwriting style that he has. Here's a man who's very intelligent. Uh, we see that in the flashbacks where that's established in the flashbacks growing up. He's incredibly intelligent. He's very eloquent as, as Kovacs. But as Rorschach, he's this thudding, I don't want to say simpleton because he's not using simple language, but it's just a very, like I said, rudimentary speech and writing pattern. And Doc, I don't know if you want to expound upon what led to that or, you know, what that means. I'm going to uh, butcher a quote from Einstein, which is, you know, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. Rorschach is conserving mental energy. He doesn't waste time. He doesn't waste effort on things that he considers to be meaningless. Communication is important. He knows he needs to get his point across to the people he's talking to. So do it as efficiently, as quickly as as possible and move on to the next step. And we see that with just about everyone and, and no one really questions him about it. They know why he does it. They know what the point is. You know, no one ever says that he's rambling, which is something very common that we see, for example, with people that are either grandiose or psychotic or, or uh, have other uh, issues that they're dealing with. He doesn't have that, you know, his point and compared to other people, You're not trying to decipher. You're not trying to get to an underlying meaning. That's his intention. We know that he has other things going on, but that's never going to be communicated to anyone else when he's in that mode. Now, having said that, you mentioned when he's Kovacs, he can do that because he knows that at some level, that's not really him. I I know I've mentioned this phrase before. If you can't, you know, if you can't, uh, dazzle him with your brilliance, then baffle him with your bowl. That's at one point in his life where he's trying to fit in, trying to understand what the game is. At this point, he's making the rules, so he doesn't have to play that anymore. That's that's what it comes down to. It, in other words, if he wrote a cookbook, it would say, food good, eat. Do you really need more than that? Laconism taken to its extreme, as he does with most things. Again, I guess going back to the the absolutism, no compromise, no surrender. We see that in his response to the Keen Act, where he says, you know, never, he never intends on surrendering. He's been hunted by the police for years because of his vigilante nature. 
And he's willing to die for his beliefs in the end. In fact, he requests it because he knows that he has to die. What does that say about him? That he is that willing to take it to the ultimate extreme. He's willing to he's willing to kill for his beliefs and he's willing to die for them. There is a nobility in that. It can be argued by others, not me, but it can be argued that there is a nobility in that. But what does that say about him that he's willing to go to that extreme for his beliefs? I'm not sure that there are many people that can understand the idea of a complete lack of fear of consequence. That is what it speaks to. In other words, he's willing to dole out punishment for anything that he sees is wrong. And this is the one area where he's not a hypocrite. The point being, if others find that what needs to be done is absolute, then by all means, go ahead and try. In other words, you know, he is willing to defend his, oh boy, I was going to say honor. I mean, that's that's not really the proper word. His pride, his uh, his ego. I mean, there's something about a lack of connection with the rest of the world, though, because in a way, when you see this, usually people that I'll, I'll actually go ahead. You mentioned nobility. I'll give you a noble example. Someone like Martin Luther King, he had no issue going to jail for what people said were crimes. He was assassinated. We all know this. And in some of his speeches, he pointed out he may not be long for the world. He didn't know what was going to happen. He knew he was a marked man. But the thing is, that makes him a martyr. He knew that he had a cause that he was reaching out to other people and wanted them to see exactly what was wrong with the rest of society and was willing to stand up for it. Others saw that because he proclaimed it in a way that he rallied people. Rorschach never did that. The closest Rorschach ever did was hold up a sign saying the end is nigh. He basically was saying at the time, this is what I think is going to happen to the world. I think there's a lot of destruction happening. But rather than doing what most people would do, which is, hey, I want us to come together and, and try and accomplish something so that it doesn't happen. He basically does whatever he thinks is necessary, doesn't really explain to anybody why he's willing to go to these lengths, and that's that. So rather than being a martyr, he's literally just a... Actually, he's, he's nothing. <laughs> he's a footnote at best. Yeah, he, he's evaporated. Like, that's, you know, that's what Dr. Manhattan does. He just basically takes him out of existence. You know, and, and by the way, yeah, talking about what Dr. Manhattan does with him, if you read the comic, I mean, come on, you got to admit, that's pretty cool. You basically control all of matter. You're basically a god. I mean, that's that's incredible. But anyway... You know, I digress. Well, you brought up ego, and I think that it goes to his point about the the notion that he is the only one who can save the world and bring this justice and peace. He believes that the world is lawless. Existence carries no meaning other than what we ascribe to it, and that he is the only one who cares enough to give some sort of sense and rule and order and... He has to be the one to do this. That is a profoundly egotistical thing to say and to believe. And again, he believes this to his very core and is willing to die for it. What does that say about his ego and that that mindset that, you know, and, and I think you mentioned it earlier, that you are the only one who can save the planet? You know, it's interesting. We've talked about narcissism recently with uh with tony stark and this doesn't qualify like for narcissistic personality or, or, or anything of the sort it goes back to that disconnection with the rest of society he's on a completely different plane he he's trying to rewrite all of the rules of engagement for how people are supposed to interact and unfortunately Nobody got the cheat sheet on how they're supposed to interact with him. We've already established that Night Owl is the closest one and it wasn't even of his own doing. So he's upset that people are losing his game when he never established what the rules were. 
So he's creating this whole sense of anguish himself. He's creating the world of chaos and violence and just total evil in his own mind. And he's trying to set up his own perfect villain. That's his goal. Everyone has to have some sort of goal in life. He lost his regular goals a long time ago, working in a garment shop, all of that. You know, who cares about making money or anything? That's that's all irrelevant. When you give yourself the ultimate goal, a few things. One, who's going to really stand against you with that? He's trying to steal man to talk about debating. He's trying to steal man his argument. He's trying to say what you know, what tops this? What tops the existence of, of the world? Like, like, come on, come at me. Obviously, no one's going to come at him about that. No one's because no one's really even trying to match that. You know, people are trying to do good things. They're trying to accomplish positives. They're trying to eliminate negatives. But no one, at least as far as I'm concerned, people really don't get to this point. The fact that he's done this is in a strange way, kind of a marvel. He he has managed to convince himself that he has the ultimate villain. And therefore, he's the ultimate hero to even come close to finding someone that's going to agree with that. First of all, is that that's just delusional. But then to even come close to trying to reach his goal is impossible. He's really set himself up for failure. One hundred percent. It's guaranteed. Kudos to Alan Moore for going through with it, because I'm sure there are a lot of writers that would not have gone with that conclusion. And I believe, I may be mistaken, but I believe Alan Moore actually um, admitted as such. He didn't initially write Rorschach that way, but as he was writing it, he said, oh, wow, this guy has the ultimate death wish. So I, I think that that speaks to, you know, someone that just has no connection. He was dead long before he was killed. Wow. I, I like that. And, uh, I can't really find any fault in that argument. It's it's true, and it bears itself out in the story and in the characterization. Moving now into the treatment portion of the, the show. Oh, boy. Now, we see him, and a large part of what we know about his background is because of his sessions with Dr. Long in the, I guess, the prison psych ward, where he starts off kind of going along with Dr. Long's beliefs to try and treat him, to make him better. And Long is just absolutely snowed by Rorschach at the beginning, says to his wife, oh, I think we're really making great progress. I think I can get through to him and he'll be a productive member of society, etc. Because at this point, he's addressing him as Kovacs. Then he asks him about Rorschach, and this is when he goes full Rorschach. I don't really know any other way to describe it. He goes full Rorschach on Dr. Long. So much so that Dr. Long now eventually begins to re-examine his own worldview and go, huh, I guess uh, there's something to it. And then he starts talking about Rorschach to his wife and at dinner parties and, you know, begins almost alienating people around him. Side note, and this is really the only time I'm going to bring this up. This is what leads to Rorschach 2 in the Doomsday Clock event because the second Rorschach is Dr. Long's son, who read all of his journals, discovered his father's transformation into this mindset, and then gets really angry about it. So he channels that rage into becoming the second Rorschach. So it's very interesting, I guess, from a, I guess, a story tying together standpoint that they were able to draw that thread um, from Dr. Long to the, the second Rorschach. But that's, again, really the only time I'm going to mention the Long kid. But Dr. Long tries to treat him. What would you do differently? I would not use a Rorschach test. My goodness. Okay. When it comes to someone that has such a skewed view in the first place, getting into the esoteric and the the psychoanalytic side of things is not the way to go. You don't want this person to continue their fantasy world. Bottom line. You know? And is and, that because in in so doing you let them establish the rules? Exactly. Exactly. It basically leads to the person making things up as they go along, which is exactly what he was doing. He got control of the conversation from the start because of that. 
So as soon as I saw that, this was before I was even completed with my training. I'm like, wow, that's a dumb move. And I'm not trying to, to insult people that use uh, Rorschach tests or anything of the sort. I'm just simply pointing out that this type of case, I don't think that was appropriate. No, I would once again go back to the basics. OK, uh, we could talk a little bit about his background, whatever he's comfortable talking about, because that trauma, that abuse, you know, is always there in the weeds. But uh, before we even get to that, we got to get this uh, this violence under control. My goodness, that's, you know, that's the ultimate consequence that we see with Rorschach time and time again. So that's the first thing that we really need to start to address. And depending on the timeline that we're talking about here, if this is after that prison scene, you know, where he basically says, you don't understand, I'm not in here with you, you're in here with me. Once again, pointing out it's him against the world and he's the one calling the shots. And he's the judge, jury, and executioner. Exactly. At that point, I have to get to back to cognitive behavioral therapy. I see what the antecedent usually is, which in this case, it is like Rorschach's a jerk. Let's get him. And the C was, OK, let's maim and destroy and kill. Uh, OK, what's the B? Now, this is a rare thing, though. I don't have to be hypothetical with this because, once again, the style that this was all written in, we know his thoughts that the world is an unjust place. And any wrong that is done needs to be righted immediately. Holy cow. Okay. That is so incredibly judgmental. That is so short-sighted to cause problems. I think we can recognize that. He doesn't, but, you know, that's that's the point of the therapy. So in-universe, the first thing I basically would say is, can we make sure that this man doesn't have anybody else near him? You know, I'm not an advocate of, of like punishment such as solitary confinement, but I'm saying, you know, you, you have to have this man in an isolation room, period. The, the colloquial term of the rubber room, like someone completely by themselves being monitored, being watched. That's fine. The alone time might actually be somewhat beneficial. I'm, I know that there's a potential downside where you're wondering, OK, well, is he just plotting his next idea? That may very well be the case, but he has nothing to bounce it off anyone else. He he won't get the feedback. So it'll be stunted. So my first thing is, let's quiet this down. Let's stop giving this man so much stimulus. Let's stop letting this man live out these types of wild, erratic fantasies. Let's give him as blank a canvas as possible. Not a predetermined outcome, just pointing out that if we start from that base... And we point out the negative that he's done without mentioning the antecedent, without mentioning the A, just mention the C, focusing just on the C, like, because he can understand this. Violence is wrong. That's it. That's it. Just just starting with that. Violence is wrong. What the heck? Are you, you know, what are, what are you getting at? Well, you did violence. So then how do we fix that? And he may he may be stunned. He may not know what to do with that. And this might be slow. And in, in comics, I'll make it as dramatic as possible because I'm cool like that, you know? Just walk out after that statement. That's day one. That's day one of the session. Just that statement. Come back for day two after isolation. OK, have you solved it yet? Maybe he'll have an idea. Maybe he won't. That's day two. Walk out. Day three. Day four. Day five. Whatever it is. And just say, let me know when you actually have the answer. And if you don't find it, then talk to me. So you're just going to decompress the whole story then? Hey, got to do it. I know. Work within the medium. Yep. Now... I guess out of universe, is there anyone like Rorschach or can you conceive of someone like a Rorschach type that you could encounter as a professional real world psychiatrist that would have these delusions, delusions of grandeur, mm -hmm. um, the ego, the, you know, Messiah complex, so to speak, all of these, these things all rolled up into one. Well, the simple tools that help assist with this, I mean, if they're true delusions, we have antipsychotics for that. If it's severe emotional disturbance, violence and aggression, we have mood stabilization medications. We have, you know, antidepressants, anti-anxiety agents. We have all of those things. So that's the first part of the tool set. But then to get back to the more cognitive behavioral part, I'm going to kind of break it down and I'll admit kind of divert a little bit from what you were just talking about and assume that the person is not completely in a psychotic state. If if it's more just a inflated sense of self-worth, uh, as well as trying to accomplish multiple goals at a high level and 
the bottom line that I had mentioned with Rorschach to begin with, that there is violence as a result of an intense sense of injustice. That's actually very common. People lash out when they feel like the world is unfair. That's actually a pretty common reaction in human nature. Now, to get the person to realize that their sense of injustice is holding them back, that in other words, you know, we want to temper that statement that they're making to themselves. Yes, bad things do happen. They don't always happen all the time. There, there are so many variations on this. They don't always happen to me or they don't always happen to the people I love or people also do good things. You know, just some of those basics, getting any of those other statements to start to manifest in treatment is critical because once you have the alternatives, then your choices for actions begin to change. You don't have to react violently because you're not cornered. So much of this is reactionary because you feel like there's no way out. There's no other way to handle things. So when we're talking about someone that may have a legitimate antecedent, once again, to go back to using that term, a uh, legitimate situation that upset them in their family or to themselves or, or whatever the case may be, if you have the ability to have other statements that are not as negative and not as automatic and incredibly, incredibly negative, you can come up with alternatives. So in other words, I'm going to give an example. Let's say this person is with other people in a bar, okay? And they notice that someone is talking, you know, to another person and out of nowhere, they hear a statement. I'm going to give a very, this is, this is a statement that triggers a lot of people. Well, uh, according to Megan's law, I have to inform you that and I'm not even going to continue it. Okay. That's a, that's a statement that upsets a lot of people. Someone like Rorschach, if you ask them, what would you do if you heard that statement? Someone like Rorschach basically says, oh, at that point, I have a table flying at that man's head. No context, no nothing. But because they hear something like that, they're going to automatically react. Now, let's take the realities of life. The person just said, according to Megan's law, Megan's law, as in something on the legal books, as in something that this person has experienced because they have received a punishment. Something that the justice system has already started to deal with. Okay, that means that people are trying. Okay, wait a minute. So that means that there is something that's going on. It's not all or nothing. And then this person actually followed that law. So a person that did a bad thing followed that law. You mean people that do bad things can actually also do law abiding things? You know, when you give little examples like that. That still makes the person a creep in a low life, but that means that you don't have to automatically attack them. It gives the opportunity to do something else. In this case, I'm not even saying a positive. They're not going to compliment that person. They may just say, oh, that's sick and walk out of the building. But that's way better than getting into a fight and somebody getting seriously hurt or killed. That's just an example, folks. You know, there are plenty of different ways that this can be dealt with. And, and you know, part of therapy is you don't know what branches it's going to take. But whatever the branches are, you got to be willing to grab onto them when they come and, you know, really help this person find a way through so that, first of all, they do less harm. Second of all, they actually start to do more good. Well, that was a lot to unpack for a character that really just appeared in 12 issues. I think that was probably one of the deepest dives on a shallow character shallow in terms of of appearances and material. Uh, I don't know that we're ever going to get something like that unless there's a character that's like in a one shot. But in those 12 issues, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons gave us a number of incredibly well-written and iconic characters. So again, as we've said a number of occasions on this episode, uh, just hats off to them for for the work that they did. It was absolutely groundbreaking and one of a kind. So as we do with every episode, now we reach the point where Rorschach goes on doctors. I fear for you, man, on this one. Oh, oh, I'm thanks. afraid. I'm afraid what's, what's going to happen. Oh, okay. So me getting like 
electrocuted and, and, and insulted and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, you know, that was nothing compared to this. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for that. I'm just saying, like, based on everything else that's happened to you, a guy who has this kind of mindset can really do some damage. And given what he did to Dr. Long, I'm a little worried. I'm up for the challenge. I'll pray for you. So, Rorschach on Dr. Issues' couch. Hello, Rorschach. I'm Dr. Issues. I've done my research, and from Dr. Long's notes, I understand that you have certain goals that you want to accomplish as Rorschach. I want to see if we could achieve those goals in a less violent manner. World only understands violence. Soft heroes ineffective at stemming the tide of lawlessness and debauchery. Rorschach stands alone and willing to do what's needed. <laughs> well, at this rate, Rorschach is going to be standing alone in a graveyard. Already done that. Oh? Blake got soft. Used to respect him for what he did. Shame what happened to him. Shame. If you're, uh, you're able to identify shame, then what's the greater goal to avoid that? You know, besides death. Death of one man against death of everyone. Whew. Okay, so right now your focus is avoiding the worst negative? Um, is there a way we could turn it so that you try to enforce the greatest positive? Need more like me. Blake was that, once. Dryberg thinks he is, but he's too soft. And you as one man, the hard man, you're going to be able to do it anyway? Someone has to try. Someone has to impose meaning. Someone has to establish rules. No meaning to existence otherwise. Well, I'm glad that you recognize that life has meaning. That's more than I expected. Less than I expected from you, Doctor. What is your meaning? That's deep. Um, my meaning is uh, do my best, leave the world in a better place than where I found it, one person at a time. You think sitting here with me talking is making the world a better place? Well, that's my goal. Foolish. Wasting your time. Wasting mine. No discussion here changes anything outside. World still turns. Oblivion still marches on. Okay, so... We're both marching together. You know, where do you see us going, then? I go alone. You stay here and talk to dregs, trash, whores. Fooling yourself into thinking you make a difference. Oh boy, I, I see. You, you have a long way to go. And you're already there. Does that answer your questions, Doctor? Yeah. Ooh. Oh uh, boy, that, uh... Uh... You okay, Doc? I mean, like, physically I can see you're fine. You're still in one piece, which is better than we could say out of uh, most of these episodes. And no damage to your office. Uh, but I'm concerned that the maybe the emotional scars or the mental scars, they last longer, as my friend Matt likes to point out. Um, well, I mean, I'm not exactly sure what the point of all of this is anyway. I mean, you know, we're all just going to end up in the same place anyway. You know what I'm saying? Like, really? Valhalla? Well, okay, if you want to call it that, that's fine. You know, I don't care if it's cremated or underground or what, but... You know, he might have a point. I'm going to go with no. Good. Was, All right. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> I was waiting. I was like, I know you're just playing the cynic and the nihilist, but it was fun to go <laughs> along with it. Yeah. Again, as you said, that's what happens when a character like that gets taken to the ultimate extreme. Damn. He's just he's one sick, messed up individual. Yep. Yep. And I'm glad that uh, he doesn't exist. You and me both. So that's going to do it for this episode. Next week, our big, 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 big Infinity War episode, Thanos, the Mad Titan. I am so excited. One way or another, this particular issue is going to be Titanic. Get out. You, you get it? Because, like, it, you know, Titan. Please, please stop. Ti please, please stop. But it, it could be, Please, it could just, be good. Just, just shut up. You know, because like it's, it's shut big, up. but stop. then if stop it's right like now. the ship. You know? Stop right now, please. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm saying we're not I gonna... said that's enough. Hmm. I will take that penny whistle from the Celine Dion song and I will beat you with it. So none of that. 
No, just just stop. Thanos, next week, big blowout episode. So get your questions and comments in now. Uh, you can ask us via Twitter at Capes on the Couch. We've got a Facebook page and email address, capesonthecouch at gmail.com. Let us know your thoughts, your questions, anything you want to see us address about Thanos the Mad Titan in advance of Avengers Infinity War coming out next week. We are so excited about it. I know we are going to be there opening night. Big, big, big fans of the MCU. Cannot wait to talk about Thanos. So as always, you can check out our website, capesonthecouch.live. Uh, we are distributed through the Libsyn Network. You can find us on Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and YouTube. And uh, Doc, anything else you want to add before we close? Well, I just hope If that- you make another Titanic joke, I swear to God, I'll beat you with this mic. Iceberg, right ahead! Oh, God. All right, that's it. Next week's show is going to be solo because uh, Doc Issues is going to be six feet under with a microphone shoved down his throat. So for Doc Issues, I'm Anthony Sitko. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. <laughs>